and today it welcomes a guy who says that all I should say is that he loves to fly fish. Tony and Grafia, Oneida County welcomes you with all its heart. Good evening. Wow. Uh, what an environment and what a crowd. Um, before we get started, I, I also want to give my thanks to Hydro Relief and especially to Professor Phelan and Father Kevin for everything they've done to make this evening hopefully um, a mutually educational and hopefully even enjoyable experience for us. Um, I want to thank uh, Bonnie for her gracious introduction. And yes, I also work at Cornell when I can't fly fish. A um, couple of ground rules before we get started. Um, the question and answer period, which I'm going to try to make as long as possible, will be conducted in the following manner. There will be three by five file cards circulating around beginning very soon. Uh, any questions that you have, please write them down in clear, legible handwriting. Uh, they will then be collected uh, towards the end of my formal presentation. And we have three volunteers, uh, Tim, Sarah, and Carlton, who will collect them, uh, sort them so that we don't have redundant questions. And then I'll make every attempt I can to uh, answer as many questions as I can, given the time that we have available tonight. Um, other ground rules. Uh, when you've been teaching for 34 years, one of the things you learn is that you better know your audience. So you're going to get to ask me questions in about 40 minutes, so now I get to ask you questions. How many of you completed a course in advanced calculus? You've got to be kidding. <laughs> Come to a college town and see what happens. OK, all right. Well, actually, that's not a prerequisite to understanding anything I'm going to do tonight. How many of you can comprehend a number with more than five zeros associated with it? Yeah, home mortgage. Got it. OK. How many of you have read at least part of the Supplemental Generic Environmental Impact Statement related to unconventional gas development from shale formations. Wow. I'm impressed. Uh, but over the last three years of running all of the countryside of New York and Pennsylvania, one thing I've learned is that you, the citizenry, um, are all above average intelligence. And you have done tremendous amounts of homework. You've read, you've listened, you've studied. Uh, and you have bootstrapped yourself up to the point where even Schlumberger would be well to hire you. Um, so I will try not to belittle your education. I'll try not to insult your knowledge. I'll try to keep things at a level where what I'm saying enforces, reinforces what you already know and hopefully extends what you already know. Uh, so unless I say something really stupid or really wrong during this presentation, please hold the questions till later. We okay? Sound is all right? I'm too loud? OK, good. OK, so there are many ways that we can start talking about the entire process of unconventional development of gas from shale formation. One would be to start at the beginning and just chronologically go through the whole technology, the whole engineering, all the science, and that would wind up being somewhat boring. So in an attempt to act out of my usual modus operandi of being an engineer, I'm going to try to be artsy craftsy a little bit tonight and invoke the use of myth. That's usually reserved for liberal arts majors, but uh, I'm going to try. So I'm going to try to uh, educate you about the various shortfalls in science, the various pitfalls in technology, and the various mistakes that can be made in engineering in unconventional gas development by way of a number of myths. Now, as you know, a myth is a part of our uh, oral and written heritage, part of our literary heritage, and a myth is something that always has a kernel of believability to it. Smack dab in the center of every myth is a little bit of truth, sometimes even more than a little bit. But then surrounding it is the artsy, craftsy, literary part that makes the myth more interesting to hear. So I'm going to talk about tonight four myths, which you have heard about. You've heard all four of those statements. You've read about them, you've heard about them. Uh, fracking is a 60-year-old, well-proven technology. You shouldn't worry about it. It's been done a million times all over the United States, and there's virtually nothing that can go wrong. 
Well, there is a kernel of truth to that statement. Every one of those statements is at its fundamental truth. But we're going to discuss the rest of each of those myths. The next one is fluid migration from faulty wells is a rare phenomenon. It only happens once in the blue moon. Don't worry about it. It's not going to happen systemically. It's not going to happen at a rate which would cause you some concern for your underground sources of drinking water uh, or for uh, pollution by way of gas migration. The use of multi-well pads and cluster drilling reduces surface impacts. And I realize I'm using some words already here that you might not be totally familiar with, but don't worry, we're going to concentrate on each of those over the next 40 minutes or so. And finally, natural gas is a clean fossil fuel. You can't turn on TV anymore nowadays and not be bombarded with multi-million dollar, very colorful ads run by the gas industry that's trying to convince you that all four of those things are true. Not myth, but entirely true. So that's the motif I'm going to use. We'll explore each myth in turn, find the kernel of truth at it, and then look at the rest of the myth. So we'll get started with the first one. Fracking for gas development is a 60-year-old well-proven technology. Well, three years ago, our legislators in Albany didn't believe that because there is, on the books of New York State, something called CEQA, State Environmental Quality Review Act, which says whenever an industry seeks to come to New York State to do something that's never been done before and is not well proven, they are required, the state is required, to do a generic environmental impact statement and an, and an environmental review. And that's the process that we're still involved in right now. So New York State was wise, wiser than our neighbor to the south, in that we had to stop and think. So apparently our legislators three years ago did not think that this is a well-proven technology that doesn't have any risk associated with it. Otherwise, we wouldn't be having a debate about a supplemental generic environmental impact statement, and we would not be having a debate about new regulations derived therefrom. Did you know that? Okay. So since it is not, from the New York State legislation point of view, a 60-year-old well-proven technology, what is it? Well, it's unconventional, and that word means a lot to everybody. It means it's not conventional. But what does it mean when the industry says this is an unconventional development of gas from a shale formation? And therefore, why is there a need for an SGEIS and new regulations? And the answer is because to get gas out of a shale formation required the coalescence of four relatively new technologies. And I'll tell you what I mean by relatively new in a few minutes. So we're going to spend the first few minutes talking about these technologies, and by doing that, hopefully you'll get a better understanding of the science, engineering, and technology of drilling a well, fracking a well, producing gas from a well, and all the things that are supposed to go right sometimes go wrong. So, first thing, uh, directional drilling. You've all seen this cartoon before. Uh, a conventional well is drilled more or less vertically into a pool of oil, or a pool, to use a simple word of gas, not in a shale formation, but in formations where gas can be trapped. And that would be conventional vertical drilling into a pool. But here's a very important fundamental understanding of the difference between shale gas production and non-shale gas production. There is no pool of gas in shale. The gas is everywhere. If this is a layer of shale, the Utica, the Marcellus, then the gas is everywhere in it. There might be different concentrations at different locations, but the gas is everywhere in it. So if you just drill vertically into it, and you realize you might be spending $5 million to drill a well 5,000 feet down, and then come into contact with only 100 feet of shale, that doesn't seem like an economical thing to do, and it isn't. And so one of the technologies that had to be brought to bear, one of the four, is the ability to turn a well from vertical into more or less horizontal, or whatever angle the shale is. All right, so that technology was developed in the last 30 years or so, and it's perfected. It's now possible to drill a vertical well five, 10,000 feet down, and then drill what's called the lateral, or the horizontal leg, for a couple of miles, and have the end of that well be within a few inches of where you want it to be miracle of modern American technology invented here. But, next thing you need to know is you need high 
frack fluid volumes actually higher frack fluid volumes because in new york state today the regulations say that if you're joining a conventional gas well and you're fracking it and most gas wells in new york state there have been forty thousand gas wells in new york state the ones that are being drilled today are frack so it's not fracking that's at issue here it's the whole process but current regulations limit the amount of fluid to inject in such a frack to eighty thousand gallons that's why i asked you whether you comprehend numbers with more than five zero. So 80,000 gallons sounds like a lot, wouldn't quite fill this auditorium. But because this lateral can now be a couple miles long, and because of the fundamental geology of shale formations, which I'm about to explain, one needs 10 to 100 times as much fracking fluid. In Pennsylvania right now, the average Marcellus well is taking 5 million gallons of frac fluid. That's a lot more than 80,000 gallons. So what is it about the geology of shale that requires horizontal drilling? Well, it's a thin layer, many thousands of feet down there. It might only be 100, 200 feet thick, so you've got to go laterally. But what else is it about the shale that requires these high frack fluid volumes? And the answer is, if you've ever walked in any of the wonderful gorges in the Finger Lakes region, you've seen things like this image taken in Pagonic Gorge where you see these lovely, perfectly scribed lines that somebody came in there with a wire saw and cut into rock just to make things entertaining for us, right? No. Those lines are natural fractures. In fact, they're natural hydraulic fractures. They were created over the last 320 million years from gas pressure. You can frack rock either using a liquid, like frack fluid, or a gas, like methane. And so those fractures formed over the last couple hundred million years, and they are now storage areas, reservoirs for natural gas, and they're natural conduits for natural gas. So now imagine that we're down three or 4,000 feet. You got imagination, right? Because you're all above average. This red line is the lateral or the horizontal. And the idea is to drive that horizontal so that when you perforate it, and I'll show you perforations in a few minutes, and you inject fluid at very high pressure out of those perforations, that fluid goes into all those existing joints and refractures them. So all your signs that, says, that say no fracking, go back and change them all, say no refracking. <laughs> I'm kidding. But that's really what's going on. The objective is not to fracture the rock anew, it's to refracture the rock where it's already fractured. It takes a lot less energy. And fracturing the rock isn't going to help you very much because the rock is basically impermeable. It doesn't want to give up its gas. But most of the gas is currently stored in those joints. So if you can reopen them, you can create a network, a flow network, just like a traffic network. The gas that's in this joint can flow back to the well bore. The gas that's in this joint can flow into this joint and back into that joint and back into the well bore and up to the surface. So now you've got to imagine that the spacing between these joints is on the order of two feet. And you've got a 8,000 foot lateral. You've got 4,000 joints you've got to reopen on average. That's what takes all the fluid. You want to open up thousands of joints as far as you can. And that means, going back to the second technology, very high frack fluid volumes, which creates the need for another technology. How do you get 5 million gallons of frac fluid down a well two or three miles long with a diameter of the casing down there in the, in the shale is only about four inches at 10,000 pounds per square inch? How many volunteer firemen in the room? Okay, what's the pressure in your lines when you're fighting a fire? A couple hundred PSI? Okay, and you know the longer you make the hose, for any given pressure at the pumper end, the longer you make the hose, the less flow and less pressure you're getting out the other end. Right? So you need lots more power. So you need to be able to get enough power to get all that fluid down in a relatively short period of time, typically about an hour for the frack job, uh, a long distance, narrow diameter pipe, lots of fluid at high pressure. And water doesn't cut it. Water isn't slippery enough. I know that's hard to believe. You think water is slippery, but it's not slippery enough. So you have to invent something from chemistry called slick water. That is, you add a lubricant to the water to make it flow through that casing, that pipe, easier. 
which requires less power at, at, the, at the surface. So directional drilling, high fracture load volumes. Because of directional drilling, you need high fracture load volumes because of all the joints you want to reopen. And because you have high fracture load volumes, you have to slick in the water. There are other chemicals that we could talk about later that also have to be added, otherwise the process grinds to a halt or the well bore becomes unusable after a short period of time. And finally, the need for well, multi-well pads and cluster drilling. So what's that mean? All right, so here is a photograph from a virtual reality presentation given by Shell recently. So you imagine you're in, you're in a movie theater with the glasses and you're in virtual reality and you're looking in 3D, and here's the surface of the Earth. Here is a shale layer, and these vertical lines are the vertical part of the well, and these squiggly lines are the so-called horizontal parts. And you'll notice that at any location, there will be a pad up here, there are multiple wells. Why? Where is the gas in the shale formation? Answer the question. Everywhere. Where do you want to put your wells? Answer the question everywhere. So you see the idea here is you have a pad, a pad, a pad, a pad, a pad. That's cluster drilling. And at each pad, you have multiple wells, as many as the economics and the geology declare that are economical for you. So ideally, when this portion of the shale is developed, you would have horizontals spaced roughly four or 500 feet apart and moving out something like a mile so that you're tapping into all the gas that you can possibly get into it. That is the single most misunderstood and misrepresented aspect of unconventional gas development in shale formations. I'll repeat that. The use of multi-well pads and cluster drilling is the single most misunderstood and misrepresented by the industry aspect of the whole process because it defines the scale of the issue. Because of the geology that I just described, the gas is everywhere. Therefore, your inventory is everywhere. Therefore, you do not want to leave inventory in your storage facility. Where's your storage facility? Under your land. How much of the gas do you want to get out? As much as you can. What do you do to do that? You drill many wells from each pad and you cluster the pads according to spacing, geology, and leasing arrangements and available capital. Okay. So let me tell you what a typical cluster pad, multi-well pad situation looks like. We don't know what it looks like in New York so far. You could drive down to Bradford, Susquehanna, Washington County, and Pennsylvania and see it in action, but there you'd only see about 4%. 4% of the wells that are going to be drilled in Pennsylvania in the Marcellus had been drilled. So those of you who have been to Bradford or Susquehanna or, or Washington County were most, but not all, Cuyahoga County in Pennsylvania, where most of the drilling has been doing, has been going on, you're seeing the tip of the iceberg. That's what makes it so difficult for people in New York to comprehend what's going to look like in the future. So I'm going to try to give you pictures of what the future would look like. This is a, an aerial view of the Dallas-Fort Worth Airport. There's a runway, there's a runway, and there's another runway. Why am I showing you a bat map of the Dallas-Fort Worth Airport? I'm showing you an example of cluster pads. Every one of these red dots is a pad. And multi-well drilling from each pad. Every one of those red lines is a well. You got the idea? One owner, city of Dallas, Fort Worth, made an arrangement with one gas operator, Chesapeake. Ideal situation. The landowner doesn't have to worry about negotiating with other companies, but more importantly, one company gets to do as they see fit from an ideal economic development point of view, which is to get all the gas out. That picture, keep in your mind, and I'll show you what it looks like in other places in the world, and then we'll foretell what it would look like in this area of New York if this happens in New York. So. First myth, fracking is a 60-year-old well-proven technology. It's true. I'm not against fracking. There's fracking going on in New York State as we speak. There has been fracking. There will be fracking, but not the kind of unconventional gas development that we're talking about. The industry has taken advantage of a mistaken 
label that we, advocates for more thinking about this, mistakenly put forth. We called it fracking. They love it when you call it fracking because they think you don't understand the whole picture and therefore they don't care. Okay? But it's not just fracking, it's the whole picture. And I'm just trying to paint the whole picture for you tonight. But first myth, not true in its entirety. We're not talking about just the fracking. We're talking about the whole process, especially multi-well development from many pads to access all the gas so that on the surface you have a vast array of highly industrialized sites for years. So this is a page from the New York State Draft Supplemental Generic Environmental Impact Statement that summarizes these four technologies. Uh, first horizontal well drilled in the Barnett Shale, which was the experiment done in Texas. There are now almost 14,000 wells in the Barnett. And again, that sounds like a lot. How many wells does your DEC currently forecast will be drilled in the Marcellus alone in New York State? Anybody know? 200,000. No. In the Marcellus alone, New York State, 50 to 60,000. Overall in the Marcellus, about a quarter of a million. So the Barnett was a relatively small shale play. It's where the industry cut its teeth. Uh, slick water fracturing fluids introduced, 1996. Multi-stage slick water fracturing of horizontal wells, 2002. And the use of multi-well pads and cluster drilling four years ago, not 60. Fracking is embedded in here, but it's just part, a relatively small part of the whole process. So, that's the myth, here's the truth. Unconventional development of gas using high volume slick water fracking from long laterals is not a 60 year old well proven technology. It is still being developed. Every new well that's drilled in a shale formation in the world is a new learning experience for the industry because it's only a four year old industry. What's the health impact? If it's a young industry and they're still cutting their teeth on it and experimenting with it, there has been insufficient time to conduct the proper scientific investigations of all the impacts, only some of which we'll talk tonight, due to the process itself and the inevitable accidents associated with it. And by impacts, I'm talking about human health impacts, environmental impacts, and global climate change impacts. Those studies are just now getting underway. They require a tremendous amount of data to be produced. Most of that data is held secret by the industry, which means the experiments and the data taking has to be redone outside the industry. And most of these studies require cumulative time to pass. You have to be studying environmental impact over a significant period of time. Human health changes over a significant period of time enough time has not elapsed. Second myth. Fluid migration from faulty wells is a rare phenomenon. This one's a popular one right now. The full page ads in the newspapers and the beautiful slick commercials on TV show we now have four layers of steel casing and four layers of cement to protect your groundwater. As if that's new. The industry acts as if they're giving you something new. And they're not. So let's investigate the truth about this. It's rare. What would you consider to be rare? One chance in a million? One chance in a hundred thousand? Give me a number. Somebody shout it out. What would you consider to be a rare incident? One in a million. One in a hundred thousand. One in a thousand. How about uh, one in twenty? Watch. All right, so I'm going to show you a couple of videos tonight. I hope you don't mind. This is for the entertainment part, but also the education. Um, you've all heard about Dimmick, Pennsylvania, and how 13 out of the 43 wells that were drilled there in a nine-month period, in a, in a one-year period, in a nine-square-mile area, went bad. When the industry says the well went bad, that means it lost integrity. That means instead of the stuff that you were drilling for coming up the well, it came up not only up the well, but outside the well. That's by definition loss of wellbore integrity and that. So this video is taken uh, in what's called the cellar, the area at the wellhead. This is the wellhead. This is where you want the gas to be coming up. You'll see a broader view of this in a minute. This water is this rainwater that's accumulated in the cellar around this wellhead. And uh, 
Let's see what happens here if I push this. So that's not your hot tub. That's methane and other hydrocarbons bubbling through the water. And if there wasn't water there, since it's odorless, colorless, tasteless, you wouldn't know it's there unless somebody actually tried to measure it. Uh, but that's a well that has lost its integrity. And the industry wants us to think that that's a one in a million or a one in a hundred thousand event that's so rare we shouldn't have to worry about it. So this is the so-called uh, Christmas tree which exists at the, uh, the wellhead after the well has been drilled and fracked and is in production. There's your production line. Uh, I'll show you another video. Beautiful trout stream, north central Pennsylvania. That's gas bubbling. The nearest gas well was two miles away. Now the industry says that bubble, those bubbles were always there, and they weren't. Uh, they occurred within a few weeks after the wells were drilled and cracked. Okay, so there's another telltale. If you see bubbling in a stream, then you know there's been loss of wellbore integrity somewhere. I have another question for you. So far you've answered all the questions correctly. How many of you have ever seen a forest floor bubble? Do you think the gas is so smart that it's only going to bubble in a stream? The two miles between that stream and the well that's causing that, there's also methane migration through the forest floor or through farmer's fields or through somebody's backyard. I'll show you some other videos later. But let's concentrate on the technology and engineering of a well to see what things go wrong that would cause those sort of incidents to occur. And then we'll, we'll look at some data, industry data. I don't invent data. I grab it from the industry and say, see, you did this. You can't argue with your own data, I hope. And I'll show you data about what I think is not a rare incident. So I was lucky enough for many years to be working with uh, a company called Schlumberger, which you've heard of. They're a chief competitor to Halliburton. Um, and we did some experiments in the laboratory. And I'm going to show you the experiment, and by doing so, you're going to learn what it actually looks like down there. That's one of the problems with this whole process. You can't see what's going on. And it's very difficult to measure what actually happened. And it's very expensive to measure where you can what happened. So I'm going to show you an experiment. Here's a block of real rock. It's not shale. It's a tight sandstone. Uh, it's about six feet on a side. We drilled it right down the middle of it. We cased the drill hole. We cemented the annulus between the casing and the rock. We perforated the casing, and then we injected it with frac fluid in which there was a red dye. When the experiment was open, over, we broke open the rock to see what things looked like. Now, when I told my mother I was getting a PhD in rock fracture mechanics, her first reaction was, what, you're going to work in the graveyard? <laughs> Tombstones, they have to be rock fractured. Where else do you fracture rock? I said, Mom, you know, energy resource. And yeah, it is fun to break things in general, but it's a lot of fun to break things using high technology. So you excuse me if I act nerdy shit at this point. All right, so we've done the experiment. Let me explain what you're looking at here. The silver pipe is casing. In this case, we only had six feet to drill through. There was only one diameter of casing. In a real well, there would be multiple diameters of casing, as we'll see in a minute. The gray is the cement. Part of it's been removed here, you can see. But this gray area is cement. Why is there cement? What, what, what's, what's the science that's behind the need for cement? Well, there's, first, there's technology. The hole that you drill better be larger in diameter than the casing. Otherwise, you can't shove the casing down the hole, right? Well, the hole is typically about two inches in diameter larger than the casing, which now means you have space between the steel casing and the rock, which is open. And the science says anything that's in the rock at that point, like gas or liquids, can get into that space and go all the way up to the surface and cause the problems I just showed you in the video. So you fill that space, called an annulus, with cement. The cement is, is there as a sealant to fill up that space, 
but it's also there to stabilize the well so it can maintain the very high pressures without bursting the steel. So the cement is a very important part of the engineering of a well and the technology of creating the cement, mixing it just right and getting it down there is extremely complex. Think about that. That thin sheath of cement, roughly an inch thick, has to cover the outside of every layer of casing and the innermost layer of casing, the production casing, can be two or three miles long. How do you get that cement down there and fill all that volume perfectly so that it bonds forever to the steel, bonds forever to the rock, never cracks, never degrades, never corrodes? Impossible. Here's another view. I wanted to show you a perforation. The perforation is a hole that's literally explosively shot through the cement. Here's the cement. There's a hole. Here's the hole going out of the cement and into the rock. The frac fluid comes out of the perforation, goes into the rock, pressurizes that, and causes a hydraulic fracture. You're now looking at one. Dyed red. Now, this rock didn't have any natural fractures in it. It's a sandstone, a tight sandstone. So what you'd have to imagine, if this is shale, this area right here would be a natural fracture, and what we would have done is reopened it. Okay, got the picture? That's what's going on down there. Very complex engineering process that requires a lot of good technology. What can go wrong? Well, my not so dear friends at Southwestern Energy produced this set of videos, which I borrowed with attribution to them. It's from Southwestern Energy. These were shown to the EPA at a meeting and made public, so they're in a public domain. Uh, and here you go. So the red dots are gas molecules. The gray is cement. The white is the absence of cement. And you'll notice there's one layer of casing, two layers of casing, three layers of casing in this particular example. Down here is the shale. This is where you want to get the shale out, the gas out. But as Southwestern notes, in this part of the, of the world, in the Marcellus and the Utica, there are many other layers of shale between the surface and down there, which also bear gas at relatively high pressure. Those are called shallow producing zones or intermediate producing zones. There could be one, two, three of them, whatever the geology says. But there's gas under pressure here and here. So see those red molecules? They can't go anywhere because if that cement seal is perfect, they can't get into the annulus. Even though the annulus is open here, the cement has sealed it. So the gas only goes up the well and does what it's supposed to do. That's good mechanical integrity. I'm going to show you a few slides only a few slides of the many things that can go wrong. First, the cement is pumped down the inside of the well all the way out to the end and returns. That's how you get the cement in the annulus. You don't dump it down from the top. You pressurize it and pump it in from the bottom so that eventually it appears at the top. Maybe. Well, there's a Two engineers are, are, are trained to deal with conflicting objectives. The whole process of engineering design is balancing conflicting objectives. So we're trained to figure out. So one objective is that you've got to get the cement to go all the way down that trip and come back up to the level you want it to without hardening. Because if it hardens, it doesn't get to where you want it to. In other words, if the cement only gets up this far and then locks up, that's engineering term terminology, it doesn't get here and therefore it doesn't seal. However, if you make the cement too liquid and it takes a long time for it to lock up, a long time to set, not lock up, then you've wasted time on the drilling pad and time is money. So there's the conflicting problems. You want the cement to cure at just the right time not too soon, not too late. If it's too soon, you get lock up, and that's bad. If it's too late, you've just wasted hours or days waiting for the cement to cure. Okay. But when the cement is down there in a liquid form, imagine your liquid cement here, and here's gas at a couple thousand pounds per square inch. So now you're forcing gas at a high pressure into a liquid cement. You might get what's called channeling, in which case you don't get any bond between the cement and the rock. And now those gas molecules can escape up through an annulus. If, they're, if they can't escape, they become pressurized and they can migrate 
way at the surface into an underground source of drinking water, your drinking well. That's one thing that can go wrong. Another thing is that the steel casing is not perfect. It goes down in jointed sections that are screwed together. Each joint is a potential weakness. A joint can fail, the casing can corrode over time, in which case you can get gas leaking through the casing to a hole or a crack in the casing, and the same thing can happen. You can get migration of gas and liquids from down below into an underground source of drinking water. Another thing that can go wrong. Another thing that can go wrong is bad engineering. You did not do, the company did not do an adequate job of three-dimensional seismic investigations to locate these shallow producing zones or did not do an adequate job of monitoring their exploration well to figure out when they were drilling through these exploration zones. They should have felt that. They should have felt the kick. Coming up with the mud, the drilling mode, there should have been bubbles of gas. And they said, whoops, we just went through high pressure zone. Let's log it and make sure that when we design our cement job, the cement goes above it and stops. Or maybe it goes all the way to the surface. If they don't do an adequate job, which is what happened in the video of the well I showed you that was bubbling, it was determined that the cement job did not cover a shallow production zone. And so the gas was allowed to go all the way up the annulus and bubble to the surface. So that's, those are three of the most prevalent things that can go wrong. There are a whole host of other things that we could talk about later. But let's return to the myth, right? Loss of integrity is a rare occurrence. Let's look at the data. I'm going to show you two forms of data. I know how interested you are in bar charts at 7 o'clock on a Monday night. But think of it this way. You're missing a really bad NFL football game. <laughs> Here's a bar chart. Horizontal axis is the age of a well. Vertical axis is the percentage of wells affected by SCP, sustained casing pressure. In other words, one or more of the annuli there could be as many as four annuli, one or more of them is experiencing gas pressure. No annulus should experience gas pressure in a well bore with integrity. So Schlumberger published a paper back in 2003 where they went to uh, t thousands of offshore oil and gas wells and measured which ones were producing gas outside the well. And what you see is that brand new wells fail at the rate of about one in 20. <coughs> that one right there, there's 5%. One year. So initially, wells fail at the rate of about one in 20. Why? Because it's such a complex process. What you also know is what you currently feel, all those, those of you who are over 40. As you age, <laughs> OK, as wells age, the percentage of wells that go bad increases so that by the time you get to a healthy 30 years old, and by the way, shale gas wells are expected to produce for 30 years, something like 50% uh, of them are experiencing sustained casing pressure. Why? Because one or more of those things we just talked about, or perhaps something else. There's been corrosion in the casing, there's been local cement failure, the cement cracked, the cement corroded. Okay. So when I showed this data to the EPA, the guy sitting behind me from Halliburton jumped up and said, yeah, but that's for offshore stuff. And I turned around and said, you should know. <laughs> but those of you who don't know about that joke, it's not really a joke, it's pretty sick. It's the, uh, the Macondo well, Deepwater Horizon, Gulf of Mexico last summer, a Halliburton cement job. All right, so then I got this data. Uh, I'll explain it. This is data taken from 352,000 oil and gas wells throughout Canada. Uh, these are two industry people publishing in the Society of Petroleum Engineering two years ago. And I'll interpret the data for you. This is the number of wells spud. And this is the num percentage of those wells which sustain casing vent flow or gas migration as a function of age of the well. So the vertical lines are, I'm sorry, the solid line is what we're looking for. And as you can see, as time has gone by, for various reasons discussed in this paper, sometimes as much as 8% of the wells are bad. What you're seeing here is they started looking at wells that are relatively young. But even the young wells, if you look over here, this is the cumulative uh, percentage of wells, between 4 and 
of all the wells, of the 352,000 wells that they looked at, between 4 and 5 percent were bad. Okay. More recently, a few months ago, colleagues of ours at Duke University published a paper in which they formed the they, they investigated the following scientific hypothesis. We hypothesize that the concentration of methane in a drinking water well will be related to the distance of that water well from the nearest gas well. True or false? It's a hypothesis. How do you test a hypothesis? You go out and do an experiment. So they went out and tested the water at 68 water wells and measured the distance between each of those water wells to the nearest gas well. And here's the data. This is distance between a water well and the nearest gas well in meters. And this is the methane concentration in milligrams of methane per liter of water. All right, so a couple things to note here. Uh, as you get closer, as the, well water, as the water well gets closer to the gas well, the probability of you seeing high concentrations of methane goes up. Now, those of you who are scientists know that this isn't proof of causality, but it is data that shows a correlation. More study needs to be done, and more study is being done by the Duke people and others in, in Pennsylvania to determine whether there is causality. But this is strongly suggest suggested. Industry will say, as part of this myth, that everybody has methane in their water well. It's true. What are they not saying? At what concentration? Or, as part of this myth, they'll say, we've tested thousands of wells and we found out that many of them would not pass um, water acceptability tests. But what they don't tell you is that the vast majority of them don't pass water acceptability tests because of bacterial contamination, not methane or other hydrocarbon contamination. You have to listen to the whole myth. So what this says is, yeah, there's, there is methane concentration was measured in every one of these wells, but it was in the less than milligram per liter range. But there's no doubt that uh, as you get closer, the probability that you're going to find higher concentrations and the gray area, this is the trigger for look out, and this is the trigger for get out. All right, so. New York State SGEIS on this issue of well bore integrity. This is the biggest piece of PRBS that I've heard out of DEC in the last three years. So great news was announced earlier today, earlier this year. Um, the DEC commissioner and a couple of other people went down to Pennsylvania and they were told, well, this is a rare phenomenon, but if you really want to prevent it, prevent. Prevent means to never allow it to happen. The word prevent means don't allow it to happen. To prevent it, we're going to require three levels of casing in all wells drilled and shale formations in New York State. And we were led to believe that that's new. And that's the result of all the investigations done by our DEC uh, regarding problems of loss of integrity in Pennsylvania. Well, you might have noticed that no, maybe not. I don't know. How many of you read the DE, Pennsylvania Department of Environmental Protection website as a matter of 8 o'clock in the morning over a cup of coffee? <laughs> I do. So in the first nine months of 2011, 65 wells in Pennsylvania Marcellus were cited for loss of integrity. During that period of time, 1,100 new wells were drilled. What's 65 divided by 1,100? It's about 5%. So we're led to believe that there's this exciting new technology of introducing another layer of casing, but introducing another layer of casing just introduces another layer of cement. The more layers of casing you have, and the more layers of cement you have, the higher the probability you're going to have a problem. All right, so I'll give you an example. These are drawings taken from the well records of two wells in Dimmick. I have access to them. Conductor casing, surface casing, intermediate casing, production casing. 
four layers of casing. This is a drawing of the well that I showed you the video of. Here's a companion well, less than a mile away. Conductor casing, surface casing, intermediate casing, production casing. This well also went bad. So New York State wants us to believe that as part of their new proposed regulations, they're going to require, unless the company can prove why it's not necessary, intermediate layers of casing, and they want us to believe that that's new. And it's going to prevent this problem, when in fact it has almost always been used for the past 10 or 20 years in gas wells. It meaning at least three layers of casing, and in most cases, four. So the people that went down there and listened to Pennsylvania didn't listen to the right things and were sold a bill of goods and they want us to believe it. I'm sorry, but that's just my opinion. So the truth is fluid migration from faulty wells is a well-known problem. It's a chronic problem, but it has an expected rate of occurrence. So I'm often asked, can't this be done safely? Can't you drill a well, cement a well, so that there's never going to be any loss of integrity? The answer is no. Why? <laughs> because the data says it can't be done. It's not that the companies aren't trying. They don't want the wells to go bad. They lose product. And they incur the possibility of fines, not that that's consequential, and perhaps lawsuits, not that that's consequential. But it's going to happen. So the best thing they can do, the answer I give, is can this be done safely? No. So why doesn't the gas industry that wants to take a trillion dollars worth of gas out of New York State just put a billion dollars in escrow right now and, and buy out all the people who lose their water wells? Buy their homes at uh, twice now current market value. Um, and then we go on. That's a, that's a solution to the problem, right? Not a technical solution, but it's a solution. What's a billion compared to a trillion? How many zeros in a trillion? In case you don't know, a billion is one thousandth of a trillion. There's a trillion dollars worth of gas they want to take out of New York State. What's a billion? They act as if ten thousand dollars is a lot. All right, so the health impact is contamination under, of underground sources of drinking water with drilling fluid, frac fluid, and released hydrocarbons will occur at an expected rate. And our SGEIS should have the data I just showed you in it. Shame on them. If I can find the data, and I can present it to you. How comes our SGEIS did not present it? The use of multi-well pads and cluster drilling reduce surface impacts. So industry often say, see, because we have multiple wells from one site, that's better than if we have many wells over 40 acre spacing. The joke there is that they would never drill a single well into a shale formation in 40 acre spacing. That's just stupid. It's economically nonsense. They would never do that. So it's comparing apples and bananas. What you should be comparing is no drilling to multiple well, multiple well cluster pad drilling. That's the comparison. None versus what they're offering. Not what they're offering versus something that could never happen. That just doesn't make any logical sense. But let's look at surface impact. I showed you this picture before. This is a 16 well pad. So in Pennsylvania right now, the average is about four wells per pad. The maximum permitted is 19 so far, but the number is gradually rising because what companies did is they put pads down and drilled one well to lock up the lease. Then they went to another pad, drilled a well, locked up that lease, which is not a good thing to do from an economic point of view. They'd rather stay on one pad, drill, 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 frack, 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 have the gathering line in place, whoopee, but they can't do it. There's not enough capital. And they couldn't get enough people in Pennsylvania to agree to all that because they don't have compulsory integration in Pennsylvania. I said complimentary things about New York. Now I'm going to say uncomplimentary things about New York. Senator Winter, are you listening? Former Senator Winter, are you listening? Thank you very much for giving the people of New York something which is anti-American, anti-democratic, and yes, I'll say it, Tea Party-ish. Anti-Tea Party-ish, excuse me. Compulsory integration. Thank you. Stupid. Okay, so that's what a 16 well. That's not three acres with a Christmas tree in the middle of it. That's a lot of heavy industrial activity. So let me quantify it. But before I do that, let me show you that uh, this picture I showed you, the Dallas-Fort Worth Airport. 
is not singular. This is northeastern British Columbia, where there's tremendous activity going on in shale gas production. Pad, 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 pad. 16 wells from each of those pads. Again, the idea is don't leave any of the product in inventory. Get it all out. This is the current largest pad that I know of uh, in shale gas production. It's again a 16 well pad in British Columbia. Um, this is not three acres. Uh, this is the fresh water lake necessary to bring 417 million gallons of water. Uh, this is the lake that's used to contain the fluid flowback. Uh, 78,000 tons of sand, 8 million gallons of fracking chemicals, 500 frack intervals in those 16 wells. 10,000 foot laterals, two miles long, 40,000 horsepower pumps. If you got that operating in your backyard, it's not here today, gone tomorrow, and it's not low impact. This is heavy industrial activity. And remember, the picture I'm showing you is that here's a pad, there would be a pad, there would be a pad, there would be a pad, here would be a pad. Kind of hard to visualize, so I'll keep trying to get you to visualize it. New York State rules. Again, relatively recent because of compulsory integration. These are maps from permits, permit applications, in this case from Chesapeake. These are applications to our DEC back in 2008 before the de facto moratorium started. And at that point, New York State was almost ready to allow unconventional development from shale. So companies went ahead and submitted permits, uh, permit applications, and these maps are part of the requirements then. And you'll notice that each map has a rectangular area in it, and that's called a spacing unit. Spacing unit is an area agreed to by three parties. The DEC, the operator who wants to develop the gas from within that spacing unit, and the landowners. Voluntary or not, <laughs> the landowners within that spacing unit. <coughs> so as long as the company, the operator, can get 60% of that land, people controlling 60% of that land to agree, then everybody else is compulsorily integrated. But the point here is that this is roughly two miles long by roughly a quarter mile wide. And notice that it's oriented in both cases, north, northwest, south, southeast. And by now, you should know the answer to the question, why are they oriented that way? To have the wells, the lateral wells, intercept as many of those natural fractures as possible. Right? So geology, controls the orientation, all right? Geology and leasing control how many wells and how spacing, the lateral spacing and the vertical spacing, in this case, of each of these spacing units. So this application was for 10 wells to be developed inside that spacing unit. And now we try to do the crystal ball gazing. What might things look like, given what I just told you about the geology, the technology, uh, the spacing units, compulsory integration, and the proof that in British Columbia, in Texas, the whole idea is to have a well everywhere. What might it look like around here? This is Clinton. I guess we're somewhere right in here. All right, so here you go. Those are two mile by half mile spacing units, the yellow rectangles, oriented north, northwest, south, southeast. East red dot would be the location of a drilling pad. That would be an industrially ideal pad and well build out for this area. Can this happen? Well, if all the people in this area decided to get together and pull other land and make a deal with one company, what would that one company do? That's it. So when I say geology and leasing arrangements control the ultimate development, that's what I mean. Geology says that you want to orient your spacing units and size your spacing units to roughly 640 acres, a square mile, roughly two miles by half a mile, so you can get 8, 10, 12, 10, 10, 12 wells in each one. But you, the landowners, get to say yes or no because you have to deal with not one operator, not just Chesapeake, there's 74 operators in Pennsylvania you could deal with right now. I don't know how many of them are gonna be coming to New York, but that would be ideal from an industry perspective. And you can allow it or prevent it. 
All right, another proof that this is happening, even in a state where there is not compulsory integration or what they call it in Pennsylvania, although it doesn't exist yet, forced pulling. This is a map of Tioga County, Pennsylvania. Here's New York up here, uh, Tioga County. And uh, each one of these areas that look like rectangles, more or less, Shell went into Tioga County and leased most of it, one company. So these are Shell's holdings. And this is their layout for their spacing units and their well pads. This is what's planned. So if you doubt that this could happen here, why? It's happening there. Uh, 100 miles away from us. All right, so the myth, the truth is the use of multi-well pads and cluster drilling facilitates the extraction of as much gas as possible from a shale formation where there's gas everywhere. Therefore, it prolongs the indense industrialization and leaves a larger, longer-term footprint. Health impact, long-term noise, dust, and light pollution, nitrogen oxide emissions, higher spill probabilities of cracked fluid, venting and accidental emissions of produced gases for as long as those wells are in operation. This is heavy industrial activity not occurring as every other industrial activity in New York State must occur in an industrial zone, or at least in an industrial setting, according to a comp comprehensive plan. Uh, the industry would have us believe that New York State law is such that they trump everything. They can drill, they can pet, put their pads anywhere they want, except here. But there's nothing stopping them from putting a pad right next door. Doesn't matter whether it's residential, commercial, Zoning doesn't count. That's what they have us believe. And that's what they would like because that allows them access to the entire inventory. Finally, last myth, natural gas is a clean fossil fuel. It's true. You take energy equivalent amounts of the three major fossil fuels, coal, oil, and natural gas, energy equivalent amounts, and burn them. The amount of carbon dioxide produced from burning natural gas is much less than the amount of carbon dioxide produced from burning oil or coal. That's the truth behind that myth. Let's investigate the rest of the story. So colleagues of mine at Cornell, um, Bob Powerth and Renee Santoro, formed a hypothesis about a year ago, oh, a year and a half ago now, and we hypothesized that natural gas, when viewed in its entire life cycle, is no cleaner than coal or oil. That was our hypothesis. And so we began a scientific investigation on that hypothesis, which I'm going to get to in a few minutes. But first, some background on what we mean by clean. Remember, it says clean fossil fuel. And there is a kernel of truth here. Carbon dioxide emissions, energy equivalent, coal, oil, gas, gas waste. So we should be concerned about carbon dioxide emissions when we burn fossil fuels. We should be concerned because the concentration of carbon dioxide in the Earth's atmosphere continues to rise. Year, parts per million of carbon dioxide in the Earth's atmosphere. Uh, a year ago, it was roughly 390 parts per million, much higher than it's been for thousands of years, and continues to climb at roughly two parts per million per year. Those of you who have been following the discussion hopefully the scientific discussion, not the blog discussion, about climate change, are probably aware that most scientists who are engaged deeply uh, in the climate change issue say that if we ever get the 450 parts per million, that's a tipping point. That's a point where it's unlikely that humans will be able to reverse the effects on climate of this concentration of carbon dioxide. Two numbers, we're at 390, actually we're, we'll be at 392 when the next announcement is made in about two weeks. 392 versus 450, roughly 60 parts per million. Going up to two parts per million per year, that gives us how many years? 30 years. Most of us aren't gonna be around. Our children and our grandchildren will be. All right, so it's important to note that natural gas is a fossil fuel. And when you burn it, it produces carbon dioxide, and therefore it is contributing to this rise. So that in itself should tell you, we better not burn as much natural gas as we intend to right now. We better find some sort of 
substitute. But that's not the whole story. Another graph. Anybody tired of graphs yet tonight? No. What, that's why they call me Ingraphia. <laughs> you do have a sense of humor. I like that. All right, here's a, a graph going back to the year 1000, which shows in parts per billion the concentration of methane, CH4. In case you didn't know that, CH4 is a simple formula for methane. Natural gas is methane. And it shows that up until the time of the Industrial Revolution, the concentration of methane in the Earth's atmosphere was fairly constant, somewhere around 700 parts per billion. And with the beginning of the Industrial Revolution, we've seen a continuous rise and a rate of increase of the rise of the concentration of methane in the atmosphere. So, methane is a much more potent greenhouse gas than carbon dioxide. Well, how much more potent? Well, my colleagues and I believe in the latest science, and the latest science says that depending upon the time period over which you want to be concerned, say we're worried about the next 20 years, as we should be, over a 20-year period, methane is 105 times more potent than carbon dioxide in trapping heat in the Earth's atmosphere. 105 times. Even if you take a myopic view that we shouldn't worry about this for 100 years. The hell with the grandkids. Okay, 100 years is what we got to turn things around. Methane is still 33 times more potent as a heat trapping gas in the atmosphere than carbon dioxide. That means that a relatively small amount of methane can be just as important as a large amount of carbon dioxide. So, well, methane is vented and leaked upstream and downstream in gas production. Upstream means at the well site. Downstream means everything after it gets into a pipeline. So during the initial fracking and flowback period, there are large volumes of methane vented, purposely vented into the atmosphere. I'll show you a video of that. Routinely and continuously at the well site, there are leaks. There are hundreds of valves and gaskets on a well site. 16 well pad, Hundreds of valves and gaskets, and some of them leak. During liquid unloading, no time to get into the details. During gas processing, as you know, the gas comes up, it goes into a dehumidifier, it goes into a separator, it has to go to a compressor station to up the pressure to get it into a, a, a transmission line. Sometimes it has to be processed, that means natural gas liquids have to be removed. During gas processing, compression, dehumidification, there's leakage. During transmission, the average transmission pipeline, these are the long distance pipelines. For example, the pipelines that are going across southern New York State and central New York State, they are taking gas right now from the southwest and the Gulf of Mexico into places like Clinton and New York City. Those pipelines on average are 50 years old. So we already talked about engineering artifacts as they age. Uh, gas is stored, not used immediately in cities. You see large gas storage tanks outside of large cities. Those leak or vent. And finally, the gas has to get into the distribution system. These are the small, small diameter, low pressure lines that go to everybody's house and everybody's industry. Some of those distribution systems in large cities are 80 to 100 years old. And they leak. So let me show you what happens on a well site uh, during frack flowback when the gas that comes back up the well during the flowback period, a couple days to a week, couple million gallons of the frack fluid is coming back and a large volume of gas is coming back with it. And in most cases, the companies just vent it. Off it goes into the atmosphere. Now, most companies would say, that's crazy, Graffy, we don't do that. We, we, we capture it. It goes directly into a pipeline. No. If there was a pipeline available for every well on every pad, there wouldn't be enough capital in America to make that happen. So they typically drill a well and they don't frack it right away. They might drill six or seven wells in a pad before they bring and drill six or seven wells in a pad, frack some of them before they have the capital to bring the gathering line in. And in some cases, yeah, frack wells with no gathering line yet. They're just shut in for the future. Uh, others say, well, we're not capturing it, we're, we're flaring it. In other words, you just burn it off. Well, that's better than venting it because when you burn it off, you just get carbon dioxide and a little bit of methane. But in some states, flaring is prohibited. 
And some companies will not flare. Shell will not flare, ever. So where's the gas go? So I'm going to show you a video now that is done not with a naked eye. This is a photograph of a site. You see water vapor here uh, that's coming out of the frac fluid return. For scale, I've shown this piece of heavy equipment. Uh, this is in Dimmock, Pennsylvania, um, last June. With a naked eye, you can't see methane. It's colorless, odorless, tasteless. You can't see it. But with a clear camera, forward-looking infrared radar camera, you can tune the camera so that it can pick up hydrocarbons. It can see what the human eye can't. So the video I'm going to show you, anything you see in yellow is hydrocarbon. You'll see the scale of this in a minute. These are treetops. Notice that the methane is lighter than air, and it's hot, so up it goes. That was a bird that just flew by. And I'll run this just for a few more seconds so you get the scale back. I'll show you that piece of heavy equipment again. And there it is. So this is not just a casual release of a few liters of methane, it's an enormous cloud of methane. Thousands, perhaps millions of cubic feet per minute up into the atmosphere. Okay, uh, processing stations, compressor stations. This is a photograph that was taken from a distance of what appears to be something on fire. Uh, up closer, this is a flare stack on a processing station. You know, if you were driving a diesel truck through Clinton and you were doing that, you'd get pulled over. Uh, notice the time and the date. This is September 18th of this year, 2.03 p.m. This is 10 days later, 7 o'clock at night. All right, so what we, I told you about the hypothesis that we formed. We hypothesized that we could show scientifically by looking at data and modeling the phenomena that the production, the life cycle, drawing, fracking, production, storage, processing, compression, transmission, storage, distribution of natural gas emits so much methane, either purposely through venting or through fugitive emissions, through accidental releases, that it turns out that natural gas is not cleaner than coal or oil. When taken over the life cycle, considering both carbon dioxide and methane, what we found is the following. Our high estimate, and scientists never just say, here's the answer, they give you a probability distribution. So our high estimate says that here's the shale gas, grams of carbon dioxide equivalent, in other words, you can convert methane to carbon dioxide equivalent using those factors of 105 or 33, uh, per megajoule of energy produced. So we've normalized all this per megajoule of energy. Here's diesel oil, here's coal, some coal is deep mine, some coal is surface mine. Here's conventional gas, low estimate, high estimate. Shale gas, high estimate, low estimate. So even if we take our lowest estimate, it turns out the shale gas in its entirety is dirtier than coal or oil. We published that paper in April of this year. Since then, there have been seven other papers and reports published. One as recently as yesterday. Um, so if you want to do some research, call me and I'll send this to you. You can go read the other papers. And I want to compare and contrast some of them because obviously the industry doesn't want the story that I just told you, the whole story, to come out. They just want you to believe the part that you hear on TV. Although now they're saying it's a cleaner burning fossil fuel. They don't longer say it's a clean fossil fuel. It's just cleaner burning. So we got them to back off a little bit. So here's our paper. Uh, we considered both time scales of 20 years and 100 years. We use the latest science for the global warming potential. That's the ratio of the heating effect of methane to carbon dioxide, 33 for, 20, uh, for 100 years, 105 for 20 years. We considered natural gas in all its uses, not just electricity. In the United States, natural gas is used to produce about 30% of the natural gas is used to produce electricity. The rest of it is used to produce heat. Uh, and here are our methane emission factors, somewhere between 0.56 and 1.3 grams of carbon per megajoule of energy. 
Uh, Hughes agrees with us, gets roughly the same answers. Wigley agrees with us, gets roughly the same answers. The United States EPA, in its latest report from last month, says 0.75. That's about right in the middle of our estimate. The three papers that are in red were funded <laughs> by the U.S. government, by the U.S. government, or by the industry. They chose to only look at the 100-year perspective, as does your D-E-C-S-G-E-I-S. They consider only the 100-year, and they use a global warming potential that was published from data from the industry of 25. The latest science is 33 over 100 years. They consider only electricity, because obviously natural gas will have an advantage over burning coal for electricity. So they're slanting their view, and they say, nope, the answer is somewhere around 0.3 to 0.4, as opposed to EPA's 0.75 and our range from 0.56 to 1.3. And of course, to make coal look worse, right, they, point, they report much higher emissions of methane from coal production than we do. So they're trying to make us look bad by slanting their numbers. I don't think that's scientific and it doesn't conform to our ideas of trying to prevent uh, even more climate change. All right, so that's the myth. The truth is over its life cycle, unconventional natural gas is likely no cleaner than coal or petroleum, and conventional gas itself is comparable when taken over its life cycle to coal or petroleum. So what's the health impact? At the largest scale, I'm sorry, we like to say that everybody lives downstream, but a more true statement is everybody lives in the same atmosphere. So we're exacerbating global climate change by producing more natural gas. So in summary, why do I think slick water high volume fracking from long laterals is a higher risk to public health? I won't bother reading all of these things. I've alluded to or touched on every one of them uh, in my talk. Uh, but obviously the scale of the operation is absolutely important and the scale derives directly from the geology. The fact that the gas is everywhere and the, and the shale is already fractured requires for economic development the companies to try to drill everywhere they can and put wells everywhere they can and from that scale effect all the other higher risks derive. Another way of saying the same thing as the number of wells and the volumes of waste increase the probability of bad things happening goes up. This is not, as many people say, your grandfather or grandma, grandmother's gas well out in the middle of a cornfield in central New York. This is an entirely different breed of cat. So accidental releases of hazardous materials into the air and the groundwater increase. Cumulative effects on air and water and health from these and from purposeful emissions. Dumping waste fluid through a publicly owned treatment work, your sewage treatment plant, is a purposeful emission and it will be allowed according to our SGEIS with certain criteria. <coughs> Pennsylvania has already backed off from that and New York State is saying, well, maybe it's okay here. I don't understand that. What did we learn from Pennsylvania? We learned about contributions from lobbyists from Pennsylvania. Increased production, processing, storage, transportation, and burning of natural gas and its liquid companions increases emission of global greenhouse gases, and that's the biggest health problem of all because it affects everybody on the planet. What we do in New York State will be felt in New York City. What we do in New York State will be felt around the world. If we burn all the natural gas there is in the Utica and the Marcellus in New York State, we set back the United States' goal of reducing carbon dioxide emissions by decades. You won't hear the gas industry tell you that. So where can you find more reliable information? I'm going to conclude by asking you to get more information. As Bonnie said at the introduction, the whole purpose tonight was education. I'm going to be educated by your questions when we're done here in a minute. Hopefully I've helped you learn more about this whole process. If you want more information from vetted sources, peer-reviewed journal articles, government publications, publications put out by reputable organizations, not blog sites. Uh, you can go to either of these sites, www.pseehealthyenergy.org. It's an organization I helped found a year ago. Uh, you will not find junk 
You will not find anonymous blog junk on this website, only the highest quality information. Or you can go to Earthworks Oil and Gas Accountability Project, <coughs> www.earthworksaction.org, and uh, they've been at this far longer than we have in New York State. And both of these sites are very deep and full of very high quality information. So if you want more, that's where you should go. Other than that, thank you very much for attending tonight, and I'm looking forward to your participation. So Bonnie is going to read questions. What do you expect will happen to horizontally hydrofracked wells in 20 to 40 years, uh, considering deterioration of cement and rusting of steel casings? Uh, excellent question. The first answer is contained in some of the data I showed you. There is no reason to expect at this point that wells of this type drilled in New York State are going to behave any differently than wells drilled anyplace else. Same companies, same technology, same promises that they're going to do the best they can, and that's good. They will do the best they can in most cases. But we can expect that over time, more and more of these wells are going to experience loss of integrity. And that means a higher risk of contamination of underground sources of drinking water or methane migration directly into the atmosphere. It's to be expected. Okay, what would you propose as an alternative to the lease income for the landowners? My thoughts are biomethane and pyrolysis products grown on the land instead of drilling. This would use native vegetation and uh, horticulture, neuteroculture fields? Heteroculture <laughs> Hetero fields? Heteroculture fields. Okay, that, that is an excellent question which opens the following issue, which I didn't even talk about here. If not natural gas, then what? Again, the industry often says, we need natural gas. We're in an energy crisis. Well, we're not really in an energy crisis. The U.S. is actually using less energy now as a, a country than it did two years ago. And it will continue to use less energy per year, in my opinion, because of the great efforts that people and corporations are taking to reduce usage of energy, that's conservation, and increase efficiency of energy use. So we're not in an energy crisis, we're in an energy balance crisis. So if we subtract out fossil fuels, oil, coal, and natural gas, from our energy portfolio today, we're in bad shape. They comprise over 80% of the energy used in the US today. So we can't overnight substitute something like bio uh, or wind or solar but it should be patently obvious to everybody by now we should have started doing that decades ago we should have started doing that during the first energy crisis in the 70s so we can't afford to make that same mistake again rather than putting all our capital in risking our environment on another fossil fuel that is going to run out natural gas is not renewable at least not for another 300 million years it's going to run out along with, the, along with the oil. The coal won't run out in our grandchildren's lifetime, but as you notice, burning coal is death. Kills 50,000 people a year in the United States alone. And it's going to cause irreversible harm to global climate. So we have to find alternatives, but they have to come not as a single silver bullet. It can't just be bio, it can't just be solar, it can't just be wind. I'm saying things you already heard. We have to have an intelligent energy policy, an intelligent energy strategy not only in Washington, but also in Albany. And I hope Governor Cuomo is listening. He's painted himself into a corner. He's our environmentalist governor, but he's also our Joe Baby Joe governor. And I think, personally speaking, he would like out of that corner. And we can't just say no. We've got to say, tell the governor, and, and we have to say it in words that he understands politically, and that these words have to be said by people he'll listen to. He won't listen to me, he won't listen to you. But he will listen to people who are in power. And if they tell him there is another way to get jobs, there is another way for an industrial future for New York that is sustainable and healthy, he'll listen. If he sees it as a way out of the corner, he's 
pain of themselves. And that's a long answer to a question that you raised, but it's a very important issue. Other forms of energy have to come online as soon as possible. Uh, for a gas company, what would be the smallest parcel of land that uh, makes economic sense to develop uh, to extract natural gas? Excellent question. Uh, rule of thumb right now in, in the Marcellus. Uh, I can't give you a rule of thumb for Utica and New York because there hasn't been any development um, in New York or Pennsylvania of Utica. In Marcellus, the rule of thumb is it takes about 80 acres to develop an economic well, which is why on a 640-acre spacing unit, like the ones you saw show out in Toyota, or the ones I predicted would happen around here, you have about eight wells. You can technologically nowadays, with about a mile lateral, drain 80 acres of all of its gas. So a company isn't going to want to just lease an 80-acre piece, because that means they only get one well. They're going to want to have at least 640 acres. And I would predict that sometime in the near future, companies will be petitioning our legislators and our DEC to increase the allowable spacing unit size. Okay, Bruce Selleck of Colgate University said at a uh, recent presentation at Utica College that Utica Shale um, north of Route 20 was not commercially viable for gas extraction. If not viable, why are gas companies uh, soliciting leases in that area? Uh, I don't know the, the scientific basis for that statement. Uh, there have not been a sufficient number of exploration wells drilled in the Utica in New York State to define where or where not there will be productive production. I should point out that there has been productive production from the Utica in Quebec, which is north of us, last time I looked. Um, so I think it's way too early to make a forecast like that. Um, more wells, exploration wells that have to be drilled and companies are investing to do that. The Utica is being heavily targeted in Ohio uh, by some of the same operators that were putting most of their money into the Marcellus in Pennsylvania. Uh, because it turns out the Utica also has some oil in it in Ohio and natural gas liquids, which can also be very productive and lucrative. So we don't know very much about what the Utica is doing up in this region. It is deep enough to conform to current DEC regulations for production. Who gets new jobs when fracking comes to town, locals or out-of-town people? Okay, so I promised I would say I don't know when I don't know. I'm not. Uh, an economic geologist, a ge ge geographer, I'm sorry. So I would refer you to the ongoing studies being done at my place, Cornell University, by Professor Susan Christofferson. Um, you can go to Google Susan Christofferson and you will see an increasing number of economic impact studies being produced by her research group at Cornell. I would warn you that there have been a number of economic impact studies done out of Penn State and by our DEC as part of their SGEIS. And I am told by Professor Christofferson that those are questionable. That is, that they, uh, they did what you and I would never do at the end of the month, which is attempt to balance our checkbook by only looking at the income side. You get the point? So one has to adequately assess not only potential income to landowners and to the state, but also has to assess all the costs, and that's harder to do. And so I refer you to Professor Christofferson for, for that answer. Uh, how do those who are monitoring an active pressurized well know if uh, the fluid has leaked into an aquifer? If pressure changes at the wellhead, isn't that the normal result of high pressure hydrofracking? How do we know fluid migration is happening in time? Boy, that's an, that's an excellent question, and it would take far more time than I, wanna, than I have for just that question right now. The, the best thing to do, and you've heard this before, I'm not giving you new news here, is to have baseline studies done of all the water wells in a region that's going to be developed. Uh, that forms a basis, a database. So in 2000, no, I'm sorry, 1998, the USGS um, sent a proposal to Congress, the United States Geological Survey, asking for $8 billion to do something which has never been done in the United States, which is to form a database of geohydrology in the United States. 
Imagine that. 2011, we still don't have one. We do, we do not have a database that says, at this location, drinkable water is at this depth, and this is the chemical composition of that drinking water as a function of period of time. January, February, March, April, May, June. If we had that database, we would have baseline for everybody's water well in the United States. We wouldn't be reliant on some professor, some Duke, on a $20,000 budget to go out and test 68 water wells and then be accused by the industry of not being statistically significant. When the industry itself has tens of thousands of water well tests, which they will not release to our colleagues at Duke. So the best thing to do is to have baseline testing so you know what's in the water before they come to town. And then you have that testing periodically done. While the joeing is going on, while the fracking is going on, one month later, six months later, one year later, five years later, ten years later. And all that data is done by competent individuals and added to a database that the New York State DEC keeps and landowners keep. People talk about putting tracer materials into the frac fluid can be done. Uh, there is tremendous science that can be done, isotopic analysis, chemical analysis to determine which rock formation is actually producing um, hydrocarbons from down below. So it is possible to fingerprint from which rock formation the stuff is coming. But that's very expensive testing. Is it possible to get a copy of your PowerPoint presentation? Uh, yes. Um, I've always made all the presentations I've done publicly available, but I do not use my Cornell webpage for that because I want to separate out my Cornell research activities from this. Uh, but if you send me an email, ari1 at cornell.edu, ari1, uh, I will send you a copy of this presentation. I noticed that somebody was videotaping tonight. Is that mm -hmm. going to be made? Yeah. And if somebody wants to, I can leave the presentation with somebody from Hydro Relief if they'd like it yeah. for distribution. Sure. Just let me know. A R I 1, the number one, A R I 1, at cornell.edu. Uh, radioactivity was not covered. Radium two, uh, 226 uh, radio uh, nuclides. Um, going contained in methane? I'm not quite sure what that. So the question is an issue that I cover again because I'm not expert uh, in the area of radioactive contaminants in the Marcellus. I did mention NORM, naturally occurring radioactive materials, are in all shale formations to various degrees. Therefore, the shale that is excavated when the well is being drilled will contain naturally occurring radioactive materials at various concentrations. There is some coverage of that in the current SGEIS. I am told by people in the know in this area uh, that that coverage is insufficient. Um, there is an issue of not only the drill cuttings, but potentially having unacceptable amounts of radioactivity in them. The fluid that comes back up the return frac fluid will have dissolved radionuclides in it. That also has to be assessed. In Pennsylvania, um, they do a better job right now uh, of detecting radioactivity in materials that are brought to their waste dumps. That's why some of the material is trucked into New York State. Um, another issue uh, with radioactivity is radon. Those of us who live in New York State know that radon is always a threat. Uh, there is radon in natural gas always, to some degree. Again, you have to assess it to determine whether it's at harmful levels. But the radon will travel with the natural gas. It's not possible to remove it by dehydration or processing where the natural gas goes. The radon does too. The good news is it has a very short half-life. So as long as it's in the system for many weeks, by the time it gets to your gas burner, or your gas stove, the risk is tremendously reduced. However, if it's not in the system for a few weeks, that is, if it's produced here and used here, then that level of protection decreases. So again, these are scientific questions, as I mentioned at the beginning of my talk, that are just now being asked, but are not yet answered.
Uh, how do we protect ourselves against compulsory integration? Can it be overturned? I made snide comments about it, but again, I'm not, I'm not a politician. I, I don't know. Um, can it be overturned? Well, you might want to read the history of it, how it happened. Um, it was relatively recent, and uh, the, the bill was brought by then Senator Winter. Um, and uh, it was unanimously approved. There was no debate. It was one of the last things considered by that session of the New York State Legislature deep in the night. So can it be overturned? I'm sure some, there will be tremendous amount of comments to the SGEIS about that. Unfortunately, the SGEIS is a generic environmental impact statement. It has nothing directly to do with, com with compulsory integration. So hire a lawyer, fight it if you can. Does this process call, cause earthquake potential? Uh, yes, uh, in, in two ways. So you probably read recently that there has been, there have been swarms of relatively low magnitude earthquakes in Texas, Arkansas, Oklahoma, and England. By low magnitude, I mean in the twos and threes, there have been spikes of 5.6 in Oklahoma, 4.3 in Arkansas, threes in Texas. Um, there is, in my opinion, not much debate left on the science of whether the use of underground injection wells for disposal of frac waste are culpable in causing these swarms. There have been a couple of detailed scientific investigations, peer-reviewed papers on that topic, uh, the USGS uh, and the DOE have both proclaimed that yes, it's very likely that um, underground injection of large volumes of frac waste at high pressure can indeed lubricate faults and joints and cause them to slip and propagate, and that's by definition a earthquake source mechanism. The jury is still out as to whether fracking itself over a region that is the injection of large volumes in each well, but with many wells on one pad and many paths closely adjacent, could a region of a few square miles, a few tens of square miles with hundreds of wells all being fracked over a relatively short period of time also initiate low-level earthquakes? Jury's out. Um, jury is still out also on the question of whether what we're seeing with the swarms of low-level earthquakes is a prelude or a conclusion. Is this actually beneficial in a sense that it's relieving stress in the Earth's crust? I don't think most seismologists would say yes, but I don't know of any seismologists that are going to bet their degree in saying that, hey, but wait a minute, we might be causing a buildup of stress in the Earth's crust because of all these small-scale earthquakes. Again, I'm repeating myself. More science that should have been done, or should be doing, should be underway right now, that somebody needs to do, somebody needs the funding to do it, and where do you get the funding? Is wastewater permanently polluted? Uh, will there be uh, new technologies to clean it or not? Is wastewater permanently polluted? The answer technologically is no. Uh, for example, there are companies operating in Texas and Pennsylvania that I have, I visited them in Pennsylvania, um, that are frack wastewater recycling facilities. They're specially designed using one or more chemical or physical processes that ingest the frack fluid, which is highly contaminated with things that are not beneficial to human or animal life. And the water it goes through one or more physical or chemical processes, and what comes out the back end is drinkable fresh water in a highly concentrated quantity of the materials that have been removed. Uh, that is one of five techniques that can be used to decrease the risk from frac return fluids. That is processing for recycling. It's very expensive. Not many companies are using it right now. So we have small startups that have invented these technologies. You have big companies like GE who are trying to promote uh, their more widespread use. Uh, but the economics haven't kicked in yet. We don't have enough companies doing it enough so that the price can come down. Oops. Uh, is, the <coughs> oh, thank you. 
is the injection of fracking fluid a one-time event for each well? Okay, good question. I, I should have done a better job of explaining how a well is fracked. So I mentioned that there are various stages of the fracking. The one well is not fracked in its entirety at one time. Remember, the lateral can be a mile or two long. Typically, a frack job on a well is done in about 500 foot stages. They start at the end of the well, they frack 500 feet of it, they block off that section, move back, frack the next 500 feet, block that section, move back another 500 feet, etc., etc. Again, complex technology, everything has to work or they screw up the well. So in its entirety, entirety if you have a 5,000 foot lateral and you're fracking it in 500 increments, that's 10 frack jobs. Each frack job would take about a half a million gallons of frack fluid. But after that well has been completely, completely fracked and it goes into production, some years later, the production will decline to a point where it becomes uneconomical to keep the well in production. At that point, the well is shut in and plugged, hopefully. And by plugging it, we hopefully cause it to no longer be some sort of grief for future generations. However, some companies might choose to go back to a well that has ceased being economical and start the process all over again. That's called refracking. That is going on in some wells, uh, for example, in the Barnett, which are now more than 10 years old. They were fracked in short, short, uh, short laterals, um, using not the best chemicals, um, using not the best fracturing pressures, and so they're going back and extending the laterals or refracking the laterals that are there to try to get them to come back into production. Sometimes the production is enhanced, sometimes it isn't. Is there really a ban on fracking in New York City's watershed? And if so, how does it work? Uh, the answer is uh, tentatively yes. The current draft SGEIS says that there can be no development using unconventional means of shale gas within the New York City watershed and within the Syracuse and the Atmos watersheds because they are unfiltered water supplies. It works by the SGEIS asking the New York State to pass new regulations that prohibit such development in those watersheds and within X thousands of feet from the boundaries of the watersheds and I can't remember the exact number. That's how it's supposed to work. However, I point out that with all the setbacks, all the setbacks currently being talked about in the SGEIS, the draft SGEIS, the SGEIS does not offer any scientific basis for those setbacks from private properties, from public water supplies, from lakes, rivers, streams, and the New York State and Syracuse water supplies. They pick a number, 500 feet, 1,000 feet, 300 feet. That's something that should be assessed scientifically. For example, I showed you the data from Duke. In Pennsylvania right now, a company is assumed guilty if their gas well is within 1,000 feet of somebody's water well, and the people who own that water well allege that their water well has been contaminated. The company is assumed to be guilty if their gas well is within 1,000 feet of that water well. Well, the data from Duke says that 1,000 feet doesn't make any sense because clearly 3,000 feet it's more likely as a potential distance between a water well and a gas well for substantial contamination. So again, I would like to have seen the SGEIS do a much more thorough job of investigating what Duke came out with. They just poo-pooed the Duke study and said, it doesn't matter because they only looked at two water wells and two gas wells in New York State, it's irrelevant. Well, do your homework, PEC. Go talk to the Duke people. Find out what study they have ongoing right now. They're looking at hundreds of wells. Wait six months and there are those results, and then you can, can use them to scientifically deduce what would be an adequate setback from a water supply. Uh, can you please address the amount of fossil fuels needed to conduct this operation? That's a great question. How much fossil fuel, how, what quantity of fossil fuels are needed to conduct? Well, you know, actually, I know that number, but I can't tell you, I can't remember. The paper that we published out of Cornell on greenhouse gas emissions, we literally had to go through dozens of reports and papers and countless calculations and spreadsheets to figure out exactly how much fossil fuel is burned 
occur well to include it in the carbon dioxide emissions from each well. And I don't know the answer, I can't remember, but it's a substantial amount because heavy equipment operating 24-7, hopefully 365 from the industry's point of view, and on a well, with, on a pattern of 16 wells, that's going to be going on for about three years. So you've got thousands of horsepower pumps uh, operating continuously for months, plus all the truck traffic, plus all the on-site electricity generation, uh, all the compressor stations operating again, thousand horsepower pumps continuously forever, as long as the gas field is, is producing. Uh, it's a measurable and predictable quantity, and it's not inconsequential, which is why many people have been saying, if you're going to be here for 30 years, which you say you're going to, why not start now converting all your equipment to burning natural gas? You're saying it's a cleaner fuel than diesel. So. Uh, Professor Ingrafia's wife is keeping his dinner warm. <laughs> is it 10 o'clock? 8 o'clock? <laughs> I got a two-hour ride back to Ithaca. I think I'm giving, being given a hint. I, I, I think that that was to release you. Well, thank you. <laughs> thank you very much. Everyone help yourself to the uh, information out there.